So without um, further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, our first speaker, who's uh, Connor Bradley from uh, the Tamanel Group uh, at TU Delft, who's going to talk to us about uh, quantum uh, computing in Diamond. Please take it away. Hi. Uh, let me just share the screen. Okay, do you see my slides? Yes. Great. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, actually, today in the Netherlands is King's Day, which means that really I should be floating down a canal somewhere drinking beer. Um, but <laughs> given the current circumstances, I'd say this is a pretty good substitute. Um, so I'm going to tell you about control, coherence, and entanglement of nuclear spin registers in diamond. And as Josh said, this is group widgeting in the group of Tim Tominiao um, at QTech in Delft. Now, first, a little bit of motivation for our work. Um, in Tim's group uh, and at QTech in general, we are working towards realizing quantum networks based upon MV sensor in Diamond. And ultimately, we envisage an architecture that looks something like this, um, where we have these multi qubit nodes based on Diamond chips that can be photonically linked together to realize remote entanglement. And the idea here is ultimately to realize a quantum net internet. Um, but also to have the capabilities in these nodes to realize uh, network-based quantum computation and simulation. Now, for those of you that don't know the MV Center so well, uh, it looks something like this. In the diamond lattice, a nitrogen atom replaces a single carbon spin, and sitting next to that nitrogen atom is a vacant site. And the thing is, this MV center forms an electron spin complex, a spin one system that has some really cool properties. So firstly, the electron spin itself is really quite coherent. And this gives us good single qubit gates. Um, they can be well over 99%, and they basically just work very well. But what makes the MV center quite special is that it combines these spin properties with a really good optical interface. So if we shine laser light on the defect, um, we can access spin conserving and non-conserving transitions. And this gives us single shot readout and spin initialization, both with very high fidelity. Finally, light that the MV emits in the zero phonon line is optically coherent. Um, and this means it can be used to realize these remote entanglement links. And especially by uh, the group of Ronald Hansen, also at Delft, um, we've seen some really cool demonstrations including the loophole free bell test a couple of years ago um, and more recently deterministic uh, entanglement delivery across the network. So these are some really cool features that we can build upon and in our group what we do is we combine this with these hybrid spin registers. So we take this electron spin of the MV and we combine this with carbon-13 nuclear spins. So about 1% of the diamond lattice is carbon-13 this means that each MV center sits in a bath of carbon spins, and we can interact with some subset of them. And the ones we interact with, well, we can use those as data qubits and as quantum memories. Finally, alongside the carbon spins, we have one extra nuclear spin. That's the nitrogen spin also of the MV. And you can see this kind of like a bonus qubit similar to the carbon 13s. Now a challenge in these hybrid systems is to interface the electron spin, which has a natural dephasing time of about five microseconds, with these weakly coupled carbon spins. So in order to have a number of accessible spins, we have to work with carbons down to couplings of about 10 kilohertz or so. And this naturally means that the interaction time for a C0 is about 100 microseconds to a millisecond. And of course, that's a bit of a problem because the electron spin, well, it's defaced by that point. Fortunately, we have a workaround, um, and this is dynamical decoupling. So if we apply microwave pulses to flip the electron spin periodically, um, we can decouple it from the noise it feels from the spin bath. And what we showed in our group is that if you apply enough of these pulses well enough, you can actually extend the electron spin coherence beyond a second. And really the take home message there is even if you have really quite weakly coupled carbon spins, you can do good two qubit gains. Now in the past few years, um, people have developed a number of schemes that allow uh, two qubit gates to be built into these decoupling sequences. 
And we've seen some really cool demonstrations, and I just want to showcase a few of those. Um, so in Ronald's group, we saw entanglement distillation between diamond chips separated by about three meters. In our own group, um, we showed repeated quantum error correction of the three qubit code. And in the wider community, also some really nice uh, quantum Darwinism uh, using about four nuclear spins. So this is already pretty cool, um, but there's a challenge and that's that so far the largest entangled state shown comprises just three qubits. And the question is, well, what limits us and what do we have to do if we want to get further um, towards these really more advanced protocols? Um, and this basically boils down to um, the two qubit gates that we've used to date. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, um, but I just want to outline a few drawbacks of the current schemes and why we felt the need to develop something new. Um, so the main issue uh, is that, so firstly, each carbon spin sits in its own unique lattice site, and that's good, um, because it means that the dipole coupling um, between the electron and the carbon spin is unique for each spin. Um, but the schemes that we used until now rely on a specific interaction term of that dipole-dipole coupling. And for many of those carbon spins, that term is very small. And what this means is that the two qubit gates become very slow and therefore the fidelity drops. And actually in some cases, we don't even see such carbon spins. So firstly, we would like to relax that requirement such that we don't rely on this specific interaction term. Furthermore, the gates used until now have very strict timing requirements, which makes it hard to parallelize them. And they only really work very well for the spin one systems, which is okay for the MV center, but for example, for the group four color centers, uh, spin half systems, they only work to second order. So they're not so good there. So we want to come up with something new um, that gets around this and allows us to overcome these challenges. And so we designed a scheme that would allow us to do this. Um, it looks a bit complicated, but I'm gonna lead you through it. So the idea is that we're gonna build radio frequency driving, kind of like NMR, into a decoupling sequence. So we have our microwave decoupling pulses and we interleave our RF driving. Now what you see on the right hand side is basically an NMR experiment. So when the electron sits in the spin state zero, then all of our carbon spins process at the same frequency, just the Lamour frequency. However, if we put the electron in the spin state one, we turn on a hyperfine interaction and each carbon spin now takes its own unique frequency. And what this means is that if we drive a carbon spin only when the electron is in the spin state one at this specific frequency, well, this is the only one we drive. So we get some selective coupling. And the goal is to build this into our decoupling sequence such that we realize this sort of interaction, um, which is locally equivalent to a C naught. Now we're gonna make use of one trick, um, which is the following. So if you look across this decoupling sequence, if the electron starts in the spin state one, well now this RF pulse is resonant and this one and so forth, but not these ones. Um, and conversely, if we start in the spin state zero, well now the second, the fourth, the sixth, and so on, they are the resonant ones. What this means is that we can actually design two sequences that when we bring together through the principle of superposition, uh, give us this controlled interaction. So that's what we do here. Um, and as I said, I'm gonna lead you through uh, how the gate really works. So let's start with this red case. So we started with the electron in the spin state one. And here our nuclear spin starts pointing up. And so we're gonna see how it evolves across the gate. So in the first period, we're gonna work in the rotating frame. And this means when we're on resonance, we just drive down towards the equatorial plane. But after some time T, you know, we come off resonance. And now in the rotating frame, we just process around the Z axis. Um, and here's the challenge, because now when we come back on resonance, we want to continue driving towards the equator. Now what we have to do is therefore to change the rotation axis to account for the angle we process through. Um, and that's captured by this equation here, which just depends on the coupling and the evolution time. So if we do this, we drive down, and if we continue throughout, at the end, we're along the equatorial plane, 
pointing in one direction. So that's half of it. But then we have to also consider the blue case. So here we again started up and we first processed and we're still gonna take into account that precession angle and change the axis for our first driving period. Um, but we're gonna do one additional thing, which is we're gonna put a relative pi phase shift. If we do that, um, then we track this precession again. And now again, we're on the equatorial plane, but we're now pointing in the opposite direction. And this is exactly what we wanted. Um, we have a maximally entangling two qubit gate um, because we created the anti-parallel states. So this sounds great. And then of course the question is how does it work when we bring it into the lab? So what we did um, was we took a 10 qubit system. It's comprised of the electron and nitrogen spin of the MV along with eight carbon spins. And the very first thing we did was we took a carbon spin that previously we weren't able to control and we used the two qubit gate to initialize it, entangle it with the electron and read it out. And that's actually what you see here is the tomogram for a bell state created between the electron and that carbon spin. The first thing, it looks quite nice. The bars are more or less what we would expect. And the bell state fidelity is about 97%. We take into account other errors and we get all together that the two qubit gate fidelity is about 99% and that's a pretty good start. However, things are a bit cooler in this system um, because you'll notice that actually every nuclear spin couples to the electron. And what this means um, is that if we first entangle the electron with one carbon and then with another, um, we make a GHZ state. And if we then projectively measure the electron out, um, we're left with just a bell pair between the two carbons. So what we did was perform that experiment actually for every possible pair of spins in the system. And what you see here is the grid of measured bell state fidelities. And in every single case, um, that value is above 0 0.5. And that means we can arbitrarily entangle pairs of spins in this system. And we think that's really cool, um, especially when you look at compiling more complicated circuits being able to mediate these longer range interactions um, is a big step over, for example, just nearest neighbor couplings. Um, so that's quite nice. Of course, the question is how does this perform when we make things a bit more complicated? And a benchmark there is to try to create multi-qubit GHC states, um, for example, of this form. So we first prepare the electron in superposition and then we sequentially entangle um, with each nuclear spin in turn. And at the end of that, we're left with a GHC state, um, which therefore we then want to measure a fidelity with. Unfortunately for GHC states, uh, we can have quite uh, efficient witnesses for entanglement. Um, so we just need to measure some subset of multi-qubit operators, and we can do it with a sequence that's like this. Uh, this is essentially something like a parity measurement. If we do this for our seven qubit state, then we get a set of bars that looks like this. And the gray bars are what we would like to see. The colored bars are what we measure. Um, and the good thing is that they broadly overlap. So even for this seven qubit case, um, we see that we have a fidelity above 0 0.5 and therefore genuine seven qubit entanglement. And this was a really nice result for us. It's a big step on the three qubits that were shown before and it told us that we're making some really nice progress. Of course, you can plot the GHZ fidelity versus the number of qubits. That's what you see here. If we simply model it with our individual two qubit gates, um, we do better than what we would expect. And this basically tells us that crosstalk in the gates um, is kicking in. And that's something we have to address if we want to improve. Um, but it also tells us that there is room for improvement and hopefully progress we can still make. So that's more or less what I wanted to say about the two qubit gate. Um, but I also promised to talk about coherence. So I already showed you dynamical decoupling of the electron spin. And actually we can do something pretty similar um, with our carbon spins. Um, so what you see here actually is for the case of the carbon and also the nitrogen, which has a smaller gyromagnetic ratio. Um, and we apply decoupling pulses. And what you see is that as you increase the number of decoupling pulses, the coherence time goes up. And quite remarkably for the carbon spin, um, this time reaches beyond 10 seconds. 
And for the nitrogen spoon, it actually exceeds a minute. And why we think this is particularly interesting is in the context of quantum networks, where it will be necessary to store fragile quantum states in one part of the network whilst we, for example, perform operations in another part. Um, so we thought this is actually quite a significant step and something we think um, will be very useful looking forward. So with that, I more or less want to summarize um, on this work. Uh, so we have new two qubit gates for controlling nuclear spins. Um, the gate fidelities can be quite high um, and allow us to access more spins than before. So we were able to realize this 10 qubit system um, with quite long memory times also. So what I want to do uh, with the last five minutes or so um, is just to talk about one other work that kind of built out of this um, and then some outlook. Um, so firstly, uh, this idea of atomic scale imaging. Um, so I just told you that we have access to many more spins than before. Actually beyond the 10 qubits we had in our register, uh, we can access about 27 carbon spins for this MV. Um, the control over some of them is not as good yet. Um, but it's already good enough to measure the individual couplings um, by using, uh, for example, double echo experiments. So what we did here was measured 177 nuclear-nuclear interactions. You can see these like C0 almost interactions. Um, and that's what you see in this grid. So the size of the ball tells you the coupling um, between carbons found at, for example, these pairs of frequencies. Now, the thing about these couplings is that they actually encode spatial information. And that might not look very obvious to the eye, but if you run this through a computer algorithm that we developed, um, you can actually retrieve the spatial structure. And the thing that's really cool about this structure is actually we know the position of each of these carbon spins to one atomic site, um, so better than a bond length. Um, and we think this is partic particularly interesting in the uh, long-standing goal of nanoscale MRI, these ideas of imaging single complex molecules um, with really, really good precision. There's one other cool thing in this experiment, which is actually this table encodes all of these couplings, and these couplings are actually, in some sense, unwanted perturbations for our two qubit gates. So we think if we take these into account for our quantum information, and we can actually still do much better there. So we were quite happy with this work. Um, the six of us spent about a day building a model. You can see we looked a little bit fresher in the morning than the evening, but at the end, we think it looks pretty cool. And if you would ever like to see it, you can come and visit uh, the lab in Delft. Um, so with that, I just want to look at some points of outlook. Um, firstly, making use of these large spin registers. Uh, firstly, uh, we want to look at many-body physics because we now have quite complex interacting spin systems um, where we actually also have quite good control. So, for example, we can use flow K dynamics um, to see some really cool phenomena. Um, and we're also looking at new techniques, for example, dynamic nuclear polarization and some novel readout mechanisms that allow us to access with better control some of these uh, additional spins. And then on the quantum information side, um, we can incorporate the nuclear-nuclear couplings, as I just mentioned. Um, but I'd also just like to say that we have now access to enough spins, and we think probably good enough fidelities, um, that we can look at uh, implementing some new QEC schemes, error correction schemes, including some fault-tolerant protocols. So we think that's something cool to work on in the coming months. Finally, back to where I started. Ultimately, um, we want to make use of these large spin registers within a quantum network. And the big goal there is to distribute entanglement across the network faster than it is lost. And a challenge there actually comes in the aspect of quantum memories, because whilst I showed you these very long coherence times, it actually turns out that making entanglement adds additional dephasing due to the optical processes on the MV. Um, and therefore, we still need to make our quantum memories more robust. And we're pursuing a number of avenues there, including isotopic purification, so accessing more weakly coupled carbon spins, but also looking at strongly coupled dipolar nuclear spin pairs, um, and even the idea of having multiple MVs per node, 
So for example, one optically active MV um, from making entanglement and a second MV which hosts the quantum memories. Of course, we can also flip uh, the problem around and say actually we need to improve our spin photon interface. The MV of course uh, has a relatively no, low emission um, of about 3% in the zero phonon line, but with per cell enhancement, um, there is maybe a workaround there. So for example, in the group of Ronald, um, they're looking at fabry perot microcavities, um, but also uh, there's the potential to use alternative defects like the group four color centers, um, which are more suitable for nano fabrication. So with that, I just want to say uh, thank you, of course, for listening. Um, thank you for those that worked with me, particularly Joe and Tim, um, but also everyone else in the group and also our collaborators in Ronald's group um, and at Element 6. And of course, thank you to the organizers um, for putting this on and still keeping it going uh, in this time. Thanks. Great. I don't know if uh, any of you guys can hear me, um, but I'm just um, clapping on behalf of um, uh, a really, really fantastic talk. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Um, we just have, um, we j I don't know if you guys can hear me. We just have um, two minutes uh, for some questions, uh, lots of questions, actually. Um, please, if you're asking questions, use the Slido and not the Zoom um, to enter your questions. So uh, the, the most popular question for you um, is, uh, what's limiting the two qubit Bell state fidelity uh, in the best and the worst case in your system? Sure. Um, so in the best case, uh, there are kind of two uh, key factors. Um, one is, of course, that there is dephasing of the nuclear spins. Um, the gate times are not super fast. Um, they're about a millisecond or so whilst the dephasing times of the carbon spins is about 10 to 20 milliseconds on average. It's a small effect, but not completely negligible. Um, secondly, a more technical thing, simply adding RF to the picture introduces more noise. Um, and that's just an engineering thing for us that we need to improve also on pulse distortions, um, because these are actually really quite low frequencies at the moment. And building this into these decoupling sequences uh, is something that just technically we still have to work on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the best cases. Of course, you see there's a range um, of fidelities. And on the low side, this is actually really where crosstalk kicks in. Um, so on some cases, uh, ah. certain carbon spins are not so well spectrally isolated. Um, so we're talking to multiple spins at once. And that's somewhere where we maybe still have to think better about uh, if there are ways we can become more selective. That's, okay, thanks very much. That's uh, really fantastic. Uh